Amen. Do you love the old, old story? We're going to look at it this morning in Exodus chapter 15 is where we'll start. It's not where we'll stay. It's where we'll start. Spend a lot of time. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're in church this morning. If you've been here on Sunday nights over the last few months, uh, or even if you hadn't been here, you may have heard, because we've announced it on Sunday morning, we've been going through the names of God as they have been presented in the Old Testament. And and as we've gone through that, we've seen that those names of God, they're not just what we call him, not just what the children of Israel called him. They are names that reveal the character of God and help us to know him more and help us to grow closer to him. For instance, we have seen that he is Elohim, the strong creator God. We have seen that he is Jehovah, the personal, close covenantal God of Israel, the one who made the promise that through the nation of Israel, all the world would be blessed. He is Adonai, the God who rules. He's Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. He is Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. He's Jehovah Rohi, the Lord our shepherd. We've seen that he is Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner in victory. And the last time I preached on a Sunday night a couple of weeks ago, we saw that he is Jehovah Sid Canoe, the Lord who is our righteousness. And this morning, we're going to discover yet another name for God as we walk through this text in Exodus chapter 15. And just like all of the other names that have been revealed, we will see that this name of God is revealed during a time of testing. These names are often revealed during a time when a, an individual in the Scripture was being tested or when maybe when the nation of Israel as a whole was being tested. Now, you and I look out amongst the crowd, and I think everybody here, for the most part, understands a test. Most people around the room have been to school. Maybe you graduated. I hope you did. Hopefully you passed your classes. You understand the purpose of a test. It's through tests that the names of God were revealed. Well, what's the purpose of a test? Well, if you think about your time in school, a test was to see if you learned what you were supposed to learn, right? Now, for the most part in school, I did really good on tests. You usually don't remember the tests that you did really good on, do you? Through all of my time in school, through my time in kindergarten through 12th grade, through my time in college at Washita, there's one test that I remember. One final exam that I remember. I remember going in, because I did pretty good in my major classes. I was very interested in those subjects. But you've heard me talk about my plight with Spanish before. I remember the first time I took Spanish one, and yes, I said the first time I took Spanish one in college. I remember going into the professor just before the final exam because, you know, the test really shows whether or not you've been paying attention in class. And I hadn't been, you know. I just needed to know enough to order up at Antigua's, okay? Which it, it wasn't Antigua's back then, you know, but I just needed to know how to order at a Mexican restaurant. It's really all I need to know, but they thought I should know a lot more than that. But I remember going in and saying, you know, I, I'm concerned about this exam. Now, it was too late, but, you know, that's, if you're a teacher, you know that's what the students do. They wait until it's too late to come ask for help. And, and she said, oh, Jeremy, she said, I've been looking at your grades. She said, just come in, take the final, you'll do fine. No, I knew the truth. I knew that I wasn't going to do fine, and, and I failed the test. I failed the class. And, you know, I mean, I remember, I remember that final. I don't remember any other final exam from college, but I remember the test I failed. And, you know, that's the way it is in life a lot of times, right? We remember the tests of life when we fail. And we find the children of Israel, as we turn to the text, we find them facing a test. And just spoiler alert here, they're going to fail the test. The question is going to be whether or not they remember that and learn from that. I learned from my failure, and the next time I took Spanish 1, I got a different teacher, okay? And... Uh, and I passed. <laughs> I still don't know if I really did or if she just let me. But um, anyway, we, uh, we're going to look here in Exodus chapter 15. Let's set this up, see where we're at. As Exodus 15 begins, Israel's just come through the Red Sea. You know the story. They fled from Egypt. 
And then the armies of Egypt begin pursuing them. As I heard one commentator say, they found themselves between a rock and a wet place. Okay, they're stuck. Army of Egypt's behind them. The Red Sea is in front of them. There's no place to go until God performs a miracle and he parts the Red Sea and they cross through on dry ground. They get to the other side and we find in Exodus chapter 15 a time of thanksgiving. The, the first uh, several verses, the first 18 verses of Exodus chapter 15 is this song of thanksgiving. And I think this is appropriate because, you know, just three days ago, we had Thanksgiving. They were having Thanksgiving there. I don't know if they had turkey and canned cranberry sauce, but they had a time of Thanksgiving. This is a time of rejoicing. We look down again there in verse 20, and it says, Then Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. Can you just picture how joyous of an occasion this is. There's nothing more they know to do than to give thanks to God and to praise God for what he's done for them. I hope you do that every day. We all ought to do that every day. We ought to thank God. We ought to praise God for the way he's brought us through. But you see, that was, we're going to, we don't know what day of the week this is. I'm just going to say it was Thursday, okay? Because we just had Thanksgiving on Thursday. Today, it's been three days since we had Thanksgiving. I hope you were thankful on Thanksgiving. I hope you're thankful today. What we're about to read as we've caught up on the story happens three days after their Thanksgiving. Three days after this big song of Thanksgiving, after they're dancing around, giving praise and thanksgiving to God, we catch up in verse 22 to see what happens. Exodus chapter 15, beginning in verse 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days into the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them. And there he tested them and said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elam, where, they were, where there were twelve wells of water and seventy palm trees. So they camped there by the waters. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the way you reveal yourself and the truths about yourself in your word. And Father, I thank you that these truths, the principles of these truths, are just as applicable today as they were the day in which you gave them to the people of Israel. I pray that we would grow closer to you. I pray that we would learn something about you or be reminded of something about you that maybe we've forgotten this morning and that we'd leave here closer to you than we were when we came in. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, just three days have passed since this grand time of celebration, since this grand day of thanksgiving, we might call it, has happened there on the shores of the Red Sea. Just three days have passed. And it's easy for us to comprehend that because, like we said, it's been three days since we had Thanksgiving. And so can you imagine if your Thanksgiving celebration was anything like the one they had just had? But now three days later, they're no longer singing his praises. They're no longer giving Thanksgiving. They must have turned the news on. No, not, that's not what happened. The situation didn't turn out like they thought it should. And they started grumbling and complaining. And that brings us to the first point of the sermon, and that is that they faced an untimely test. Now you might say, now why are you calling it a test? Why do you say it's a test? Because God said it was a test in verse 25. There at the end of verse 25, it says, there he, God, tested them. They faced a test. They didn't like the fact, they just would prefer everything to keep going smooth. 
They prefer to everything keep going their way. They don't want to be tested, right? When I was in school, and, and uh, you know, they don't have as many tests now in the school I'm in. You just have to write papers, which I'd sometimes rather take a test. But anyway, don't have as many tests anymore. But back in the day, I didn't like taking tests. I'd rather just keep going to class every day and sitting there daydreaming while the t- professor spoke Spanish up there and, and just go. I mean, life would have been wonderful in Spanish 1 if we'd have never had a test, right? If we'd have never had to prove that we had learned what we were supposed to have learned. That's kind of the way the children of Israel felt. They, they didn't want to face a test. Life was going good. They'd prefer just to keep going on. It's a test. Why do I call it untimely? Because obviously, as we read the text, they're not ready for it. They hadn't been paying attention in class as God has been teaching them things about himself. Look again in chapter 15, verse 22. Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. They went out to the wilderness of Shur. They went three days into the wilderness and found no water. Can you imagine? They've been traveling. No doubt they left Egypt with supplies. They left Egypt with things they needed. They've run out of supply. They've run out of water. And it's not just them. This is, this is a huge, huge multitude of people. And it's not just people. There are animals. There are The men might say, well, I can go another day. But the kid, let me tell you, we just drove five hours, right? Kids get thirsty. Even when they're not having to walk through the wilderness. They want another drink. And you know what happens if they get another drink? Then you've got to stop again down the road just a little ways, right? Can you imagine? They're traveling, not just the men, the women and the children, and they've run out of water. They have no water. They're looking for water. And it says they came to Mara. There was water at Mara. They're, they see on the horizon, no doubt, where there's water, there's vegetation, right? They probably see the palm trees. They, see, they say there's water up ahead. And can you imagine the disappointment when they get there? They've experienced this amazing deliverance. They finally get to where there's water again, and it says it's bitter. Now, as I was reading different commentaries to try to figure out exactly what this meant, I found that really everybody had a different opinion. One commentator said that they speculated the water had large percentages of dissolved mineral salts, making it undrinkable. Another one said that maybe the water was poisonous. Another said, well, maybe it was polluted. But you know what the text says? The text said it tasted bad. That's what Moses wrote. He said they got there and it just didn't taste good. They got there and they were picky about their water. The water was bitter. It tasted bad. They thought they had a water problem. That's what they thought. But what we learn, you see, we turn over to to verse, you probably don't have to turn, I do in my Bible. You look over in verse 25, and it says they're being tested. They don't have a water problem. They've got a knowledge problem. They're facing a test, and they don't know the answer. You see, here's the correct answer. The correct answer would be for the children of Israel to look and say, Hey, God, about three days ago, we had a water problem. And you did a marvelous thing, a miraculous thing. You parted that water, and we walked across. We had a water problem, and you fixed it. Hey, God, we've got a water problem. Would you fix it? That's not what they did. They just grumbled and complained. You want to know the first sign that you're failing God's test is that you start grumbling and complaining. There's no doubt they thought like a lot of Christians think today. I've trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. They say, hey, we've trusted Jehovah. We're following Jehovah. They're following a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. That's what got them to Mara. We're right where God wants us to be, so why is life hard? If we're following Christ, shouldn't life be easy? It's kind of like, you know, I heard about a basketball player, Coach Sutherland, who, who had about 18 different opportunities to shoot the ball through the game and never took the first shot. And after the game went up to the coach, and the coach said, why didn't you shoot the ball? The kid said, well, every time I went to shoot the ball, well, a player from the other team would get up close to me. A player from the other team would get in front of me. Just too many obstacles, I didn't shoot the ball. A lot of times, we don't take opportunities in life because there's an obstacle there. 
I'm not going to serve God. There's an obstacle there. I'm reminded of an of a illustration that I read about a little boy who saw a cocoon in the backyard. Now, you're familiar with a cocoon. The caterpillar goes in there and comes out as a butterfly. And the little boy found it, and he had read a book about it. He was all excited. He was going to get to see this happen. And so he goes, and he's watching it every day. Finally, one day, he sees signs of life coming out of the cocoon. And he studies it. You know how little boys do. He's just watching it. He keeps running out there, and he keeps running out there. And finally, as he's a very compassionate little boy, he pulls out his little pocket knife, and he widens the hole. And in very short order, the butterfly comes out and falls to the ground. Shortly thereafter, the butterfly dies. And the little boy goes to his daddy and says, I don't understand. Why did the butterfly die? And he told his daddy all about what had happened and what he did. And his daddy explained to him. You see, that cocoon is a test for the butterfly. And that test strengthens the butterfly as it fights its way through. And as it fights its way out of the cocoon, it gets stronger and stronger so that it can fly. And you might be thinking, basketball obstacles and butterflies, what does any of this have to do with Scripture? What does any of this have to do with our tests that we face in life? Well, in 1 Peter 5.8, we find that. In 1 Peter chapter 5, He says this in verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect Establish, strengthen, and settle you. Did you hear that? Satan's walking about seeking whom he may devour. He's, see, he's walking about setting up obstacles for you and I to trip over. As we walk about, if we go through our Christian walk, as we walk about with Jesus Christ, he wants us to do nothing other than grumble and complain, just like the children of Israel. But did you hear what Peter said? He said, God uses those times to strengthen us if we'll look to him. James puts it this way over in James chapter 1, verse 2. He says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that what? The testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Testing, like the children of Israel went through here, like you and I go through all the time in our life, testing does two things. First, it reveals what we know or what we don't know. You see, they'd forgotten God has complete control over the water. And testing reveals where we need to grow, where we need to get stronger. Just like the Israelites, we can be firmly in the will of God. We can be right where he wants us to be and still face a great test. They failed their test. May we learn from that untimely test. The next thing we see as we look through our text this morning, very briefly, we see an unusual solution. Now, I thought this was an unusual solution as I first looked at it. And in verse 25, we see, So Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it in the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there God tested them. Don't read too much into this. I heard it preached on before that, oh, this tree that was thrown into the water, that's a sign of the cross. Well, that text doesn't say that said, oh, that's just a picture of the tree of life. The text doesn't say that either. You know what the text says? God said, hey, Moses, take that tree and throw it in the water, and that's what Moses did. You know what? We shouldn't read too much about the tree because this isn't about the tree. This is about two things. This is about obedience, and it's about faith. Someone might read this and say, well, God must have pointed out a stevia tree to him, right? You know, stevia, the natural sweetener that some folks use. That's all I know about it. But uh, somebody might say it must have been a stevia tree, made the water sweet. But you know what this water sweet means? It means pleasant. In other words, God used this act to transform the water into something that was bitter, something that was undrinkable, into something that was pleasant to drink, something that was desirable. 
I don't think there was anything special about the tree. I believe this was simply another test. The first test tested the nation. This test tested Moses. Moses cried out to God, and God said, Hey, I'll show you how to fix it if you'll trust me, if you'll obey me. I called this an unusual solution, but really what it is is a miracle. That's all we see here is a miracle from God because of the obedience of Moses. Sometimes obeying God doesn't make sense in our human perspective. I wonder if it made sense to Moses when God first said, you see that tree over there? Cut it down and throw it in the water. I wonder if Moses thought, you're crazy, but I'll do it. You know, you wonder what was Moses thinking? But it really doesn't matter what he was thinking because what matters is that he was obedient. He obeyed God. As Dr. Charles Stanley would say, obey God and leave all the consequences to him. That's what Moses did. And the bitterness was taken out of the water. I want you to know this morning that obedience to God is the only place we'll go, the only thing we'll do that removes the bitterness from life is being obedient to God. There was an untimely test. There was an unusual solution. And there's one last thing we'll look at, and that's an unbeatable promise. You see the promise there in verse 26? God said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what's right in His sight, give ear to His commandments and keep all His statutes, I'll put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. The Lord who heals you, that's Jehovah Rapha. That's the Lord who heals you. That's the name of God that is revealed in this text is Jehovah Rapha. That word Rapha appears about 60 times in the Old Testament. It means to restore, to cure, to heal. It means to repair. In some places, it means to be stitched back together. Because of the obedience of Moses, Jehovah Rapha healed or he restored the water so that it was pleasant to drink. But what a beautiful, God ma- a beautiful promise God made through this name. Because he doesn't just say, I'm the God who healed the water. What he told to the Israelites, he said, I'm the God who restores you. I'm the God who can cure you. I'm the God that when you're broken and you're torn apart, I'm the God who stitches you back together. That's what he told them. But before we go any further, before we go any further, there's a lot here for you and me. But I want to tell you what's not here for you and me, okay? This promise, the specifics of this promise were to the nation of Israel. Not necessarily to you and I. You see, he said, if you'll obey me, I won't put any of the diseases that I put on the Egyptians on you. Now, what are we talking about there? Most likely, we're talking about the ten plagues, okay? Now, you'll take some of these TV evangelists and some that are not TV evangelists, preachers that will say, look, the reason you're sick is because you're sinning. See, it's right there. If you didn't sin, you wouldn't be sick. No, 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 no. You got to take it the other way. If you're going to take it that way, you got to take it the other way, too. And that if you're sinning, well, then there must be frogs and flies and everything else around your house, right? The plagues are happening at your house if you're sinning. You can't take this one way. you got to take it both ways if you're going to take it that way at all. This promise, this specific promise, is to the nation of Israel in this day and in this time. Because we see it come true. As we, if we were to look over in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 15, we're not going to look there, but you can see there that this promise is made there again. If you looked in Amos chapter 4, verse 10, Israel disobeyed, and God says to them there in Amos, He says, I sent a plague among you after the manner of Egypt. You see, God's true to His word. I'd ask how many sinners are in the house, but then everybody would have to raise their hand, and I don't want to embarrass the person who didn't want to raise their hand, okay? Any of y'all ever experienced seeing the plagues of Egypt? I hadn't. So that part of the promise doesn't apply to you and I. But you want to know what applies to you and I? The fact he's Jehovah Rapha. 
The fact that he is the Lord who heals. He is Jehovah Rapha to you, and he is Jehovah Rapha to me. We see that in the New Testament because every character trait of God is revealed in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. And so if the Father is Jehovah Rapha, so is Jesus Christ. And we see all throughout the New Testament, we see where Jesus is healing people all throughout the Gospels, like the man with leprosy in Matthew chapter 8, or the paralyzed man in Mark chapter 2, or the man that was born blind in Matthew chapter 9, or the woman in Luke 8 who had the bleeding disorder for 12 years, and Jesus cured her when she touched him. And we could go on and on and on. But I want you to look for just a minute in Matthew chapter 8. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 16. What has happened is Jesus has just healed the mother-in-law of Peter. And we're going to look at this same event in another gospel momentarily. But there's something very specific that Matthew points out. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 16, it says, When evening had come, they, that's those in the community, brought to Jesus many who were demon-possessed. And he cast out spirits with a word, and he healed all who were sick. Why? that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sickness. It was prophesied hundreds of years before Jesus was born that Jesus Christ would be Jehovah Rapha. Look in Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. The same thing, the same incident, the healing of Peter's mother-in-law. Luke chapter 4. Beginning in verse 38. Now Jesus arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house. But Simon's wife's mother was sick with a high fever. And they made request of him concerning her. So he stood over her and rebuked the fever and it left her. And immediately she arose and served them. When the sun was setting, all those who had in, who had any that were sick with various diseases, brought them to Jesus. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying out and saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. And he rebuked them, uh, did not allow them to speak, for, for they knew that he was the Christ. Now when it was day, he departed and went to a deserted place. And the crowd sought him and came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. I mean, I would too, wouldn't you? The man's healing everybody who's sick. I'd try to keep him there as long as I could. Let's get as many sick people healed as is possible. But Jesus said to them in verse 43, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, because for this purpose I have been sent. There's no doubt Jesus could have stayed there for days, for months, for years, healing the sick, and they would have kept bringing them, and they would have kept bringing them because we know there's plenty of sick people to go around. And Jesus could have healed every one of them, but Jesus said there's something more important than physical healing. He said, I've got to go preach the gospel. I've got to go preach the gospel. The Israelites were promised physical health there in Exodus 15 where we were in our main text. They were promised physical healing if they obeyed, obeyed God in this life. They would have physical health. But you and I don't get that promise. You can think of some of the godliest people you know, some of the greatest saints, so to speak, that you know, and they still get cancer, and they still have heart attacks, and they still die. We live in a broken world. We live in a world where our bodies are plagued by sin. We're not promised that physical health like the Israelites were promised in, in that one. And, and you know, physical health is wonderful. Physical healing is compassionate. It's a good thing. But it's temporary. Because we're never expressly told this, but we can just look around and it would be on the news otherwise. You would believe everything on the news. But anyway, you know what happened to all those people Jesus healed? 
know what happened to Lazarus? Lazarus got the ultimate healing, didn't he? He was dead, and Jesus brought him back to life. Do you know what happened? They died. Their healing was temporary. We're promised an eternal healing. That's the New Testament promise of Jehovah Rapha. We're promised a permanent healing, physically and spiritually. John gives us a glimpse of it in Revelation chapter 21, in verse 4. He says, God will wipe away every tear from their eye. There'll be no more death, no more sorrow, no crying. There'll be no more pain. The former things have passed away. That's our New Testament promise from Jehovah Rapha. That's the promise that you and I have. Musicians are going to make way for the invitation. And here's the thing. There's a test in order to get the physical healing. They faced a test. The Israelites faced a test to get their promise of healing. You and I face a test. It has one question. One question. Do you believe? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. If you believe, you'll be saved. This morning I ask you the one question test. Do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is Jehovah Rapha? Do you believe that Jesus Christ came to pay the penalty for the sin that has destroyed our human body and will destroy our souls for eternity if we don't accept his promise of eternal healing? Do you believe? If you don't, If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I invite you this morning to come and to pray. This morning, we do have people who need prayers for physical healing in this life. And you know, he's still Jehovah Rapha in that situation as well. Do you need to pray for healing for them? Listen to this. I get convicted about this from time to time. We spend a lot of time praying for sick people, for sick people who are saved. And there's nothing wrong with that. But there's a lot of people who are sick spiritually who have never been saved. How much time do we spend praying for their salvation? How much time do we spend praying that Jehovah Rapha would be revealed to them in such a way that they would accept his gift of eternal healing so that they can spend eternity in heaven just like you and I do when we've accepted Jesus Christ? Is there somebody you need to pray for this morning that they would trust Jesus Christ and be saved? Pray for them now as we stand and sing. Number 121. 